Welcome to this evening's Fireside Chat. This event will be recorded and available for viewing at a later date. By joining this session, you are giving consent to be part of a recorded event. Please note that participants' cameras and microphones have been disabled and the chat feature will not be available. Thank you for joining us, and it's now pl my pleasure to turn the event over to Professor Brian Ogilvy, Chair of UMass Amherst History Department. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Ogilvy, Department Chair and Professor of History. As you know, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, which had a profound impact on the psyche and trajectory of our nation. Tonight, we have the privilege of speaking with two people who are directly involved in the country's recovery from that event. Kenneth R. Feinberg, class of 67, and his business partner, Camille S. Byros, have helped to administer the response to some of the most complex public crises in recent American history, including the BP Deepwater Horizon Gulf oil spill, the Boston Marathon bombings, and notably the 9-11 Victims' Compensation Fund. Ken wrote about these experiences in his memoir, What is Life Worth?, which was recently adapted into the Netflix film Worth. We regret to inform you that Chancellor Subhaswamy will not be able to join us tonight. However, we are very pleased to announce that UMass President Marty Meehan has enthusiastically agreed to host this evening's event. And now, please join me in welcoming Prefet President Marty Meehan. Thank you, Brian. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests. Kenneth R. Feinberg is one of the nation's leading experts in alternative dispute resolution, having served, as was mentioned, as special master for the 9 elect and Bit Victim Compensation Fund, the Department of uh, Justice Victims of State-Sponsored Terrorism Fund, the Department of Justice Boeing uh, 737 Max Crash Victim Beneficiaries Compensation Fund, the Department of the Treasury's Top Executive Compensation Program, and the Treasury's Private Multi-Employer Pension Reform Program. He was also a Special Settlement Master of the Agent Orange Victim Compensation Program. In 2010, Ken was appointed by the Obama administration to oversee compensation of victims of the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And most importantly, he's one of our own, having received a bachelor's degree and an honorary doctor of law degree from UMass Amherst. Ken is one of uh, UMass's most distinguished alumnus. I have known and admire Ken for many, many years. I had the good fortune of working with Ken when I was serving in the United States Congress, and Ken was the chief of staff to the most effective United States Senator in history, Edward M. Kennedy. Also with us tonight is Camille uh, Byros. Uh, Camille is currently the Director of Claims Administration at the Law Offices of Ken Kenneth R. Feinberg, PC. She develops, designs, implements, and supervises claims administration, settlement programs, including the development of criteria, guidelines of eligibility, evaluation, scoring, payment, and reporting of submitted claims and claim determinations. She is a fund administrator for the Archdiocese of New York, Brooklyn Diocese of New York, Rockville Center Diocese of New York, as well as numerous Catholic dioceses in the states of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, California, and Colorado under the Independent Reconciliation and Compensation Program. At this time, I'd like to invite Ken and Camille to join me for a fireside chat. Welcome, Camille. Welcome, Ken. Um, if, if we could kick this off, I'd like to first ask both of you, uh, for those who don't know, to tell us a little bit about yourself and your work, if we could open that up that way. Well, I can just say that uh, you, you did a pretty good summary, Mr. President. I must say, um, uh, what we have um, done and accomplished really over the last decades, 30, 40 years, after tragedies, we get a call from a president an attorney general, uh, Governor Deval Patrick, and, and Mayor Menino after the Boston Marathon bombings. And Camille and I are asked to design, implement, and administer claims programs for victims, like, as you pointed out, 
the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. And what we try and do when public officials ask us is to set up a program that will compensate innocent victims of tragedy. It is not easy. It is a challenge because it's very, very emotional. But uh, we, when asked to make the call, we, uh, we try and do that. So uh, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to speak with you uh, this evening. I've been working with uh, Ken for over 40 years at this point. And together um, since 9-11, uh, we have become the go-to people to design these types of programs, whether they are charitable programs or whether they are corporate programs. So we have been, we, we, we sometimes shudder when the phone rings after a horrible event because we are aware that um, our services will be uh, requested in, in a situation like that. How do you approach something as complex as figuring out how to allocate that September 11th Victim Compensation Fund? And how was your work on 9-11 different from other work that you had done previously? There'll never be another program like the 9-11 Fund, never, in American history. 13 days after the 9-11 attacks, Congress, as you know, uh, Mr. President Meehan, Congress passed a law creating a special alternative compensation program for the victims, the airplanes, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon. So each victim or surviving family could decide voluntarily, I don't want to go to court. I don't want to hire a lawyer. I don't want to sue the World Trade Center. I don't want to sue the airlines. I instead will come to Camille and Ken and I'll submit a claim and get paid from the public taxpayer. This is public taxpayer money. And in 33 months, we distributed over $7 billion to 5,300 surviving victims or family members who uh, stood in the place of a deceased uh, victim. And practically everybody came into this fund voluntarily. We, you know, we employed the, uh, the appropriate experts and, and, and personnel. So for example, for the 9-11 program, we had a host of accountants and uh, economists as well as lawyers assisting us in, in developing the process and also in doing the calculations for future loss of earnings. Ken, what made you want to write the book? Oh, uh, after this was over, after the 9-11 fund uh, had finished, I wrote the book for two reasons. First, it's cathartic. I had to get out in the written word what we had gone through, the emotional trauma. And it was debilitating to meet with hundreds and hundreds privately, with hundreds of families and, and physically injured victims. And I found that it would uh, it reduced the stress for me to get down on paper what we went through. But secondly, as, a, as an old history graduate of UMass, I thought it was important for future generations to know how unique this fund was, how um, it exhibited, in my way of thinking, the best character of the American people. And I thought that, that future students, and citizens could pick up this book, What Is Life Worth, and understand much better uh, the purposes, the goals, and how we administered uh, the program. Was there, was there anything during the research and writing process that surprised you or made you think differently about any aspects of your work? Well, Camille can answer that as well, but I'll tell you, 
what we learned in what I learned in writing the book is what we experienced, which was the incredible differences of how claimants who came to see us, human nature, how they reacted to 9-11. I mean, I would have been better off a, a rabbi or a priest rather than a lawyer. Anger, frustration, disappointment, pathos. Um, what I didn't anticipate and what is featured in the book is how victims reacted to 9-11 and what they thought about uh, the horror of that day. I think it's um, the book and the movie certainly uh, educated a lot of people about the fund. It was surprising to us how, how many people were unaware how the nation came together and uh, provided immediate financial assist, almost immediate financial assistance to so many people who were in, in, in dire straits. You know, I, I wanted to bring up the, the movie because, you know, a lot of times I, I can remember when I first saw the movie Lincoln and I immediately called Doris Kearns Goodwin and said, I have to have lunch. I want to talk about what you thought was right on the money, what wasn't. And the same thing with the Boston uh, Marathon bomber case. I, I called Ed Davis as I left the theater to have a discussion about it. So I'm, I'm curious for both of you, what was the process like as the book was a, a, a adapted for the screen? Let me tell you, I never thought the book would ever be adapted. What people have to realize is I wrote that book in 2005. It wasn't until 2017, 12 years later, that a screenplay evolved from the book. And Camille and I both felt that no movie could ever accurately um, um, explain what we went through. And a great screenwriter, a great screenplay, a wonderful director, and wonderful actors really um, surprised us in their ability to transpose from book to screen what we went through. Now, there's a lot of dramatic license that goes into the movie. Uh, inaccuracies, we chuckle. Um, my, my family of harsh critics. But um, overall, I think we both concluded that they did a pretty good job of conveying that stress that we went through. And the actors were, were, were wonderful. They were very deferential to us and, and uh, gave us a significant amount of time because they were very eager to understand the program and what we went through and, and how we dealt with it all. So we spent uh, several hours with, with the actors during the course of the filming of, of the movie. Yeah, you, you could tell that. You could tell they put a lot of time and effort into it. And uh, uh, I actually thought the voice sounded like uh, like Ken's voice. And I, it was the first time I've ever seen uh, one of the Kennedys as part of a film where they didn't overdo the Boston accent uh, with <laughs> Senator Kennedy. Um, I wonder if you both could address what does the medium of film allow you that, 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 that enhances the story of the book? It's... Oh, it's Emotion. Yeah. Emotion. I, um, the book is very emotional, I think, uh, because I highlighted in the book itself, as you know, uh, Marty, various stories, actual stories of what victims or surviving family members went through. But to translate that to the screen so that you watch and hear that emotion and how families confronted the horror. I uh, found that to be something that added to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the scope of the book and made the movie, I think, in a way, um, perfecting what I said in the written word. And, and just to uh, uh, reiterate, those stories were absolutely true. So it, it was also a, a reminder to, to the, the viewing public of the horror of that day and what these families had to go through. Yeah, it captured that. Uh, it brought back all kinds of memories 
uh, for me. And you're right, Ken, it was very, very emotional. Difficult to get through that film uh, without tears. I'm curious, what was it like for both of you to see yourselves portrayed in the film? And how did you feel about the other characters that, that you knew so well portrayed in the film? Well, I, I, quite frankly, it was really a, a surreal experience. <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing was just unbelievable. And I, I, I was pleased with Amy Ryan's portrayal. I thought she was uh, uh, portrayed uh, a very sort of dignified, quiet uh, role. And I thought she did a, she did a fine job. And of course, uh, Michael Keaton, playing Ken Feinberg, I mean, my uh, children, who are very harsh critics, they said, Dad, Michael Keaton did a good job, but he ought to stick with Batman. He ought to stick with Batman or Beetlejuice. And then um, it, it, I also must say that um, my good friend Bob Epstein, who's a trustee of the university, he called after he saw the film and said he was teary-eyed speechless. Um, and for Bob to, who's known me over 70 years, for Bob to um, also have an, uh, appreciate the impact of the film, uh, that made a great deal to me as a, as a recognition that maybe it is it worked. Yeah, I, I could tell you in, in the years I've worked with uh, Bob, I've never seen a tear from him. So uh, that, that that is pretty significant. You might, you might show him at the next board meeting, show the film. Maybe he'll know him. <laughs> um, looking back at the 9-11 uh, attacks, what does that moment in history represent to you both? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm asked all the time, uh, what lesson does the 9-11 Victim Compensation Program, what lesson does it offer the American people 20 years later? And nobody knows better than you, Mr. President. Back then, the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund was endorsed by all of the American people. No red state, blue state, no liberal conservative, no, um, um, no Republican, no Democrat, unanimous. Everybody rallied in creating the fund and in uh, making sure it worked. And I remember Senator Kennedy speaking to Attorney General John Ashcroft and Republican Senator Chuck Hagel speaking to the Attorney General and, and then Senator Kennedy speaking to President Bush and let's rally around what Ken has to do and what Ken and Camille are going to try and accomplish. And the lesson is today, I doubt you'd see a fund like that today. I doubt that, the, uh, that our elected officials would forge that type of consensus. And it worked. It worked. And it's a great lesson, I think, uh, as to how the American people can rally when there's a... Um, there's something to be done here. Yeah, uh, I, I thought, to, to, Camille, I want to give you an opportunity on that too. You know, I just, it, it's one of, the, it's a, one of those historically tragic events that I can only say, uh, the only other event in my lifetime was the assassination of President Kennedy. And those two events, uh, it, it just evoked similar horror and fear. And, you know, uh, in watching the family and also reading the book, um, politics in America has changed significantly, as you say. Um, you know, I can remember any time Senator Kennedy would go to the White House, he had a list of things. And it didn't matter whether Clinton was the president or, or George Bush, uh, Herbert Walker Bush or W or whoever it was, he had a list and he was fighting for Massachusetts and what he believed in. And 9-11 is, is a great example of uh, both parties coming together. And uh, it's kind of sad to see what has happened since then. I remember when, when the 9-11 fund, I began our work on the fund. And I went to a, an airport and I figured people would come up to me and vilify me and criticize your spending the taxpayer's money and how dare you, bad things happen to good people every day. There's no 9-11, just the opposite. People came up to me 
Just, aren't you the guy doing the fun? Yes. Now get ready to duck. And they would go, oh, Mr. Feinberg, we just want to say what you're doing is fabulous. How, how you're trying to help all those poor people there, but for fortune. It could have been me or my son or my daughter. And um, it was just a different total atmosphere in which the people, the American people rallied around uh, the innocent victims and those unfortunates. It was amazing. And, and, and just building on uh, the fact that it's a different time, we actually tracked down and convinced 11 undocumented families to come into the program. Families who were petrified that they would be deported. Um, we can't imagine that that would happen today, but we, yeah. we worked so hard to bring them into the program. And one of the things we're proud, very proud of that we were able to make sure that they were taken care of. Yeah, that's fabulous, Camille. And uh, there's so much that we could learn today, uh, but that, that, that is uh, absolutely fabulous. Um, Ken, in 2011, you donated uh, 2,000 boxes of personal papers, including documentation on your work as, uh, on the 9-11 Fund to the Special Collections and University Archives. What do you hope that current and future students will be able to learn from this collection? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think um, I made a decision. All of my papers, not only 9-11 Fund, but the Boston Marathon and all of the other uh, documents and memos and letters and correspondence should be housed in one place. And I must say the late Rob Cox at the Dubois Library along with others, convinced me that it would be an appropriate place to house all of the papers for future generations. Anybody who wanted to, to do a study of the 9-11 fund or the BP oil spill fund or the Boston Marathon could go to one source. It's all cataloged there. And um, I felt that uh, there was there was a lot of interest around the country, but my alma mater uh, stood first, and the history department played a large role in this. And I decided that it was the appropriate place, and they've done a great job at the library in Amherst in cataloging the papers according to 9/11 or BP oil spill or what. And um, students uh, access the papers, and. Um, I'm very, very pleased that I did that. Well, we're very pleased that you did too and, and uh, very appreciative and thankful. And there, in so many ways, if you look at UMass Am Amherst and the progress that's been made there in the last 10 to 15 years, but uh, those papers are critical and I think they encourage other folks to, uh, to donate their papers as well. So we are all deeply appreciative uh, of your willingness to, to donate uh, those papers. No, it, it was an easy call. I mean, um, and the, um, the uh, support I've received from the librarians and the history department and the political science department in cataloging the papers and making sure that the most important papers are there for scholars and researchers to look at in the years, decades ahead, maybe. Um, I'm glad I did it. That's great. Well, we are too, and thank you so much. Um, while the 9-11 uh, Victim Compensation Fund was unique in its size, there are several other compensation funds across the nation, as, as you know. How has your work on the 9-11 Fund, both of you, informed how some of those funds were established or administered? What advice do you give, and I know you both get advice on this, what do you give to those administrators when they establish new funds? I would say um, there are some certain key aspects to, to designing these programs and administering them. Um, speed, transparency, and openness and the willingness to meet one-on-one -on -one with um, individuals, victims, families. Um, we, we in, the, in the past five years, Ken and I have uh, been uh, implementing and administering programs for the Catholic Church victims of sexual abuse. 
And, you know, we've held hundreds of meetings with these individuals because they are so grateful for the opportunity to speak to someone who is going to listen to their story and believe what they have to say. So, so I guess those are the three takeaways and, and those are the three areas of advice that I, I certainly would, would offer to someone who uh, was going to implement similar programs. I, I would add one other element, uh, historically. Never underestimate the charitable impulse of the American people. It is astounding to me over the last 40 years how the American people in times of tragedy step up. I think it goes back to Puritan New England and the city on the hill. And this notion of community and helping your fellow man, woman. But this idea that we owe each other a sense of obligation. I just think that it reinforces every time Camille and I are asked to get involved in a new program. Take the Boston Marathon. The Boston Marathon bombing, four dead and about 240 physically injured. Mayor Menino and Governor Deval Patrick announced to the country we are creating one fund Boston, a special fund. We welcome your private, not public, your private contributions. In 60 days, the governor and the mayor raised over $60 million in private donations. Wow. And um, it is just, it was astounding to us when, when President Obama came to Boston to speak at the memorial service. And he said, I remember this, uh, all Americans have a, a little bit of Boston in them. Do they ever, Yeah. do they ever? And I don't care what state you're from. Um, it's just amazing how the country tries, the, the private citizen tries to rally around the victims. You know, and, and seeing the, the movie, it brought back a lot of memories uh, for me because I, I lost 30 uh, people in my district. And right afterwards, frankly, I was following Senator Kennedy's lead and reaching out to victims. And I had I had it in the city of Lola, Middlesex Community College. I brought in all of the families and I had a, a, a lawyer who, who was an expert on uh, wills and trusts, and I had a, a, a CPA firm there, and and we basically tried to you know provide some support. But what it all came back to me in in the various depictions in the in the movie of just the magnitude of that. I I'll never forget being in a room. Every single seat needed napkins. It was uh, uh, tissues. It. it, uh, it I wonder if you could speak to that because I, I you know, I, I'm friendly today with uh, many of these families, but being in your position, both of your positions, I, I wonder if you could speak to to that experience because it brought back a lot of really emotional mem memories for me. Well, I, all I can say is that the stories, one was worse than the other, and they were just so many stand out in, in, in your mind when, when you think and you look back um, at, at what we did. But, you know, we talk a lot about the, the families of the deceased, but one of the physically injured um, victims well, stands out in, in, in my memory. This gentleman was, was burned with the fuel over 95% of his body. And he went uh, through 35 operations and insisted on coming to see us. And he arrived at our office with his medical team, his lawyers, his nurses. And it was just unbelievable to sit and listen to him. And the, the sheer will to continue to live was just absolutely remarkable. I mean, that one stands out in my mind in terms of the physically injured, but there are just story after story of uh, that, that we heard directly from the deceased families. 
And some of these stories are referenced, as you know, in the movie. But, uh, and in my book, a lady came to see me privately, 26 years old, crying. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband at the World Trade Center. He was a fireman. And he left me with our two children, six and four. Now you're going to provide me, Camille's run the numbers, and I'm going to receive $2.4 million tax-free from the fund. I want it in 30 days. And I said to her, Mrs. Jones, this is public taxpayer money. The check has to be cleared from the U.S. Treasury. It may take 60 days, maybe 90 days, but you'll get your money. No. I want it in 30 days. I said to her, Mrs. Jones, why do you need the money in 30 days? Why? I'll tell you why. I have terminal cancer. I have 10 weeks to live. My husband was going to survive me and take care of our two children. Now they're going to be orphans. And I don't have a lot of time, Mr. Feinberg, to set up now a trust and a guardian to take care of the kids. I need this money while I still have my faculties to plan this. Well, we ran down to the treasury. We ushered the check right through department by department. We got her the check in 30 days. Eight weeks later, she died. Now, you can't make these stories up. And we did, you're right, we, we heard story after story after story, and it's absolutely debilitating. And as we said a half hour ago, I'm surprised, but the film does a pretty good job of conveying to the, to the viewer uh, the nature and impact of what we went through. Could you speak, uh, both of you speak to this process uh, where you really needed families and, and the difficulties that, that you're articulating with, with families, but getting so many families to buy in uh, to this process and to this uh, way of, of dealing with compensation. Could you both speak to the difficulty of the challenge of that uh, over a period of time with a specific deadline that, that you had to get to. Um, it's an extraordinary achievement under, as you uh, articulate, the most difficult of circumstances. Well, one of the things uh, that is um, maybe doesn't come through in the film was the unbelievable fast track that we were on to get the program up and running. So the president signed the, the bill into law on, on September 22nd. And Ken was appointed in November and we had the, the operation up and running in December. So we were on such a fast track that we perhaps didn't at that time take enough time to educate the the families in a way that was a little bit more hand holding um, than we did initially because we were so anxious to get them um, information and get them to apply and get them money that um, that was one of the challenges um, and I think you see that in the in the scene in the film with the uh, one of the town hall meetings when um, they're sort of not very happy with Ken as he's attempting to explain what the program's all about. And I must say, uh, you, you mentioned earlier, um, Marty, I remember 78 people died on those planes from Massachusetts. And I remember as if it was yesterday, me and, and Ted Kennedy in, in different meetings, different town hall meetings, I remember you and Senator Kennedy urging families, angry families, give the program a chance. Yep. Ken Feinberg's from Brockton. Let him try and, and, and deliver on what he can do. And I think our elected officials, I mentioned this earlier, um, 
took a leadership role like you did in just trying to assuage very angry, distraught citizens. Look, it's terrible, but here is at least some possible financial assistance. Won't bring back your daughter or your wife, but it's, it's important. And I think, again, I think that had a lot to do with the national support we received when, when elected officials like you and, and, and Senator Kennedy and others uh, really um, promoted the opportunity for people to take advantage of the program. Yeah, and I, I took my lead from, uh, from, uh, from Ted, but I, I, what, what was interesting to me is um, he called every family in, in the Commonwealth, but I got very close with the families as he was, but to watch him, I, I watched him. And I don't think there's any person in America that that these victims who are going through so much pain, to have a man who could talk about the pain in his own life, losing his own family members. And I would have um, I would have family members who may have been Republicans, may have been independents, may have been Democrats, but he resonated with all of them. And they trusted him because they knew what he had been through in his own life. And I wonder if you could just call, you were so close to, to, to Teddy, but I, I watched him firsthand dealing with one-on-one -on -one with families and the compassion uh, that, that spoke to what kind of a man he was. And, and it, it just... It made me do a better job in what I was trying to do for the people I represent. But I, I was wondering if you would just comment a little bit on the man and, and what he'd been through and how he was able to relate to so many people, so you, many families. You, you, you've really answered. <laughs> he lived through tragedy and horror, and he knew firsthand how horror and tragedy could be so debilitating. And when he met with each of those, or, or spoke to each of the 78 families who died from the Commonwealth, they knew it was not an act. It was not a political grandstand. He really, um, he really felt or could commiserate with. Uh, it made a huge difference. The other thing that made a huge difference, I think, once people started to come into the program, and saw that the program was on the up and up, no hidden agendas, full transparency, an opportunity to be heard in private. Once people saw that their neighbors were getting compensated quickly and um, effectively, I think it promoted by word of mouth. You know, it really is a good program. It really does provide us very generous compensation. We don't have to go to trial. We don't have to wait years in a courtroom. We can come in now and get this money. And I think it was a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense. Once we started quickly to get money out in very substantial amounts, I think it sent a signal about the credibility and legitimacy of the program. And it had a tremendous impact coupled with what you know you and Senator Kennedy and, and other elected officials across the country were trying to promote as well. Camille, do you I, I don't know if you wanted to comment, but um I, I, well you know, I, I would just add that uh, in these types of programs there's there's sort of a pattern. At, at the beginning of the program, you're flooded with claims and interest. Then it sort of eases up and mellows. And then at, towards the end, as you're nearing the deadline, then you are swamped and, and all, the, all the remaining claims come in. That's how these programs tend to, tend to work. You may, you may recall, Marty, about six months before the end of the program, there was a statute that created the program. About six months before, you and Senator Kennedy and a couple of other members of the mass congressional delegation came to me and said, Ken, there's only six months to go in the program. 
and yet half the people have not yet filed a claim with you. Just give us the thumbs up and uh, we'll take here in the House and the Senate, we'll extend the program another year. And I remember saying to you, I said, don't do that. If you do that, people will procrastinate. It's human nature. They'll wait, they'll think, they're not sure. Leave that deadline. And in the last six months, the other half came into the program. 97% of the eligible claimants finally came into the program. Yeah, it was extraordinary. And I do remember that. And I think the natural inclination of, of a politician might be to say, well, let's extend it. Let's do, you know, that's let's help you out. Let's yeah, help right. you out, Camille. Let's help you out, Ken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Help us. Thank you very much. <laughs> but that's, that is exactly, uh, that is exactly what happened. And I, I, I felt uh, as time, as people were processing everything that he, they had been through, you could see that they were they were getting there. You know, I, uh, probably the first person to die on, on 9-11 was probably John Oganowski, the pilot of American Flight 11. He was from Drakeett, Massachusetts, in my district, in my backyard. And, you know, I, I, I know his wife had become very friendly with, uh, uh, with his wife and his daughters. And I could see I could see folks processing things over a period of time and and they were ready in the end that they had confidence and trust. And I wonder if you could comment to that process that many of these families went through. Well, I, again, I think it, it the horror of the situation that sort of paralyzed so many people and, and, and just trying to understand um, this program these forms, this administrative process that we were asking them to partake in was, was really, really difficult for so many of them. Yeah. Um, if folks in the UMass community are interested in learning more about the legal concept of uh, reparations or how the fund or similar funds operate, what would you recommend they look into, uh, obviously read the book, but how, do, how would you recommend they get involved in this? First, read the book, buy a couple of extra copies for your family members, then go see the movie on Netflix, <laughs> and you'll have a pretty good backdrop for um, next steps. Now, it's very interesting. There is plenty of material online. You can read the 9-11 final report, you can read the Boston Marathon, One Fund Boston, the protocol that we use, the final report, how we succeeded, uh, the Pulse nightclub shootings in Orlando, that terrorist attack killed about 50 people, uh, the Virginia Tech shootings, Sandy Hook in Connecticut, the first graders that were uh, horribly um, uh, murdered. Oh, wow. So th there's plenty out there that um, can give uh, members of the UMass community, um, uh, primary source materials on how we designed, implemented, and administered the program. It's think, there. I think all the protocols are listed online, too. Yep. You can easily find those. That's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm curious from both of you, what are your thoughts on reparations for slavery and how that could be handled if monetary, how would that play out? I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Be careful what you wish for when you talk about reparations for slavery. It is a uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Ask yourself these questions. Very simple questions, a checklist. When you decide to develop a reparations program for slavery. One, who's eligible? Who's eligible to receive compensation? And is it individual compensation? A check cut to an individual uh, 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 as defined in a program. Two, what will be the methodology for calculating the amount? What are we talking about here? Where will free, where will the funds come from? Public money from the treasury or private donations or what? Four, what will be the proof requirements for somebody to be deemed eligible who can corroborate his or her claim? Five, will there be due process? Will a person be able to have a hearing 
or an appeal if he or she is denied compensation? And finally, in my mind, are there ways, politically effective ways, to recognize a priority going forward with programs and projects designed, a type of affirmative action designed to provide extra recognition of the credibility of a claim rather than get into this thorny thicket of individual checks being cut to individual generational victims. And I uh, just warn anybody, I've learned from the 9-11 fund, public money, public money, you'll never see that again. That was a one-off. All these other programs we've talked about today, like the Boston Marathon, those were all private donations. So I'm, 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 I'm articulating challenges about reparations for slavery or reparations for the COVID you know, injury and death. I mean, you're, you're, uh, you have some challenges, but you know, I, I, I give people credit if they want to try, but it's, it's a formidable undertaking. Eligibility would be uh, a nightmare. Um, as a matter of fact, during the 9-11 fund, we had many calls from the victims of the first World, World Trade Center attack asking us why would they not be eligible to participate? We had many calls from Oklahoma City uh, of the terrorist attack there saying, why can't we participate in, in this fund? So it's really, really tricky uh, to get into the idea of reparations for slavery. I remember Senator Schumer coming to me saying, Ken, we're compensating all the victims of the, of the, that were in the World Trade Center on 9-11. But you know, there are nine families who lost loved ones in 1993, the original World Trade Center attacks, committed by the very same type of people. Where's, I mean, can't we try and help them? The law didn't permit it. And um, that's why I don't think, I think the 9-11 fund was a fabulous idea. I think it exhibited the best spirit of the American people. I think it was the right thing to do at the time. Don't do it again. Yeah. Don't do it again. Why some people, Bad things happen to good people every day in this country. There's no 9-11 fund. I didn't see a 9-11 fund. Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, where a thousand people died in New Orleans, in Louisiana. There was no 9-11 fund. Um, be careful as a matter of public policy. Brian Olavi knows all about this. Be careful as a matter of public policy in carving out for very special, generous treatment. Only these victims. Everybody else, get a lawyer, judge and jury, go to court. It's a, it's a very difficult political philosophy question in America. Yeah. As Brian mentioned, it's been 20 years uh, since 9-11. Many of our students and even some of our younger alums don't remember 9-11. Yet we live every day with its consequences, whether it's the extensive security at an airport uh, every time we fly on a plane or perhaps a loved one served in Afghanistan at some point over the last 20 years. How did 9-11 shape the world that we live in today? I think people are less inclined to take some of those rights and liberties for granted. Um, I, it, it did. It changed um, the way we live, the way we think. And um, I guess that that's, that's the point I would like to make. Don't take anything for granted. I think that's right. The other thing I would say is, again, repeating an earlier point, 9-11 had changed the country in terms of its fatalism and its diminished optimism. On the other hand, I just think the fund itself is a glorious example of communitarianism and one nation, and we help our own. And at least it's a beacon, at least, um, 
for especially young people, you're right, who didn't live through this, to look at that fund and say, you know, as President Kennedy said, government is not a dirty word and serving the public interest is a noble undertaking and my favorite. President Kennedy said, every individual can make a difference. And you see that fund, and it, it, it still gives me hope that the American people can rally around a common cause. We had a couple of uh, questions that were submitted, uh, and I want to I want to uh, ask you one of them, uh, Ken. Can you, can you comment on where, uh, on whether values from your Jewish upbringing had influenced your decision making process? Certainly, they had uh, Jewish ritual. And the values that I learned from how the community rallies, you know, you've been to enough shivers, Mr. Yep. President, how, the, um, how the, um, um, the community rallies around the grieving um, survivors, uh, the, 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 the shiva at the home of the, of the survivors, how the community uh, attends the funeral. And it's not just family members, it's the community that's there to uh, assist in the, in the burial process. One thing um, among many things I learned in my Jewish upbringing in Brockton was how uh, one death can impact an entire community and how the community almost owes it to the grieving to demonstrate their support, love and encouragement. That I think uh, was a very valuable uh, lesson that I learned growing up in Brockton. Thank you. Um, how do you uh, view the potential role of mediation in other pressing national matters? Is there, we have a lot of uh, very difficult national issues. Can mediation play a role in some of those? Mediation can play a role, but let me say this first, Mediation will never replace the American legal system. That will never happen. You choose your lawyer, yeah. I'll choose my lawyer, judge and jury will decide. That will always be the primary vehicle. Now, in terms of uh, mediation, trying to resolve national political issues or international issues, I'm dubious. Don't overemphasize the value of mediation. In any mediation, both sides need to want to get to yes. Both sides need to be transparent in desiring a third party help in getting solutions. And I'm not sure you can find that in American life today. I remember I was once approached by representatives of the Israeli government this is after 9-11. Uh, Ken, might you think you could help mediate resolution between Israel and the Palestinians? And I said, I don't think so. I don't think so because I don't think that even if you get a resolution around the table, I'm not sure that either side politically can deliver on an agreement like Oslo at the time or something like that. And so I, I sort of de-emphasize mediation as some sort of silver bullet that can solve all of our nation's national and international problems. Camille, do you have a uh, c comment on? No, I, I think I, I concur with, uh, with uh, Ken Stone on that. Yeah. So how much has your philosophy on determining how much life is worth changed over the course of both of your careers? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think um, these programs that, that, we, that we operate and implement, are, they're different. I mean, the, 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 the charitable programs that we have implemented, for those programs, it's a, a totally different criteria and formula. We, you have a fixed fund, and what what we try to do is to be as as fair and equitable as possible. And with a fixed fund, let's take the Boston Marathon Fund for example. 
we determined the same amount for every family that lost um, a loved one during that terrorist attack. That's unlike 9-11 and unlike the BP oil spill where there is basically unlimited amount of money and a calculation is done to determine past wages, future lost earnings, benefits, and all of those things that are components of what one would have earned had they survived and lived. So they're totally different um, issues. You see, it's very misleading, very misleading. The title of my book, What Is Life Worth? Question mark. People see that cover and they think that Camille Byros and Ken Feinberg are evaluating every, every individual based on characteristics like love, dignity, loyalty, compassion, sensitivity. That's not the way the American legal system works. And if you create a fund like 9-11, which requires every victim or survivor to take the money and sign a document, I will not sue the World Trade Center, the airlines, the mass port. I won't sue everybody, guaranteed. Everybody's going to receive a different, a different amount of money. Camille's absolutely right. In the Boston Marathon, it wasn't, no one signed a release. The money was a gift from the American people. So all lives lost, four of them, were valued the same. An eight-year-old dies or a banker dies, a waitress dies or a laborer dies. All lives are equal, take the money. And if you're injured, all we wanted to know in the Boston Marathon was how long were you in the hospital? as a result of the bombings. If you were in for a month, you'll get $900,000. If you were in three weeks, you'll get $800,000. Altogether different, every fund. You gotta look at the source of the funds yep. and whether it's an alternative to the tort system or a gift. Well, Brian is gonna wrap um, up. I, I, I gotta ask, uh, when are you gonna be back to UMass to teach a course, Ken? <sighs> You're putting me under a tremendous amount of pressure. <laughs> Ryan's a very effective mediator, and I'm hoping <laughs> to be back in the fall, uh, all things considered. Great. Thank you, Camille, Ken. Great to see you both. Mr. Brian, President, thank you and much. thank you, Mr. President, for all you're doing for the Commonwealth and for the university. Greatly appreciate it. Thank As you, Ken. I appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Great. you. And I would like to say a hearty thank you to President Mian, uh, Ken, and Camille for a wonderful conversation, and thank all of you in the audience for joining us. If you haven't already signed up for Read UMass, the online alumni book club, they'll be reading What is Life Worth as their fall selection. Reading begins on October 15th, and you can find more information at umassalumni.com. Thanks again for being here, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.